Good evening, everybody, and a warm welcome to a new series of the Royal Institute of Philosophy's London Lectures, which this year are on the subject of madness and mental health. And now, without more ado, let me introduce this evening's speakers. It's a pleasure to have with us Harvey Carell and Dan Dagerman, both from Bristol University. Dan Dagerman is Leverhulme Early Career Fellow in the Bristol Philosophy Department. He has a PhD from Lancaster and an MA from York, and he's published extensively both on politics and on mental health and the intersection between the two. Harvey Carell is well known as the author of numerous books and papers on health and illness, including respiratory illness, and she was the principal investigator on the major welcome grant, Life of Breath. She was the winner of AHRC's Health Humanities Inspiration Award in 2018, and she's just won another welcome major award on epistemic injustice in healthcare. So, well done you. Harvey and Dan, over to you. Okay, thank you so much for uh, venturing out to, um, to hear our brand new work so this is uh, joint work between Dan and myself. Um, and just to tie together what Edward uh, mentioned a minute ago, which is the, the project Epistemic Injustice in Healthcare, or EPIC, and the topic of today's talk. EPIC is a project aimed at understanding the sources, the causes, and what we could do to ameliorate epistemic injustice in healthcare. And in a minute, um, we will kind of cash out this, this terminology. Um, when we talk about epistemic injustice, what we are referring to is um, an injustice or a, a wrong done to somebody in their unique capacity as a, as a knower or a speaker or a, a testifier, not in the, in the legal sense of the term, but somebody who is trying to provide information or participate in decision making, offer their uh, thoughts and ideas, contribute to a, a quest uh, of, of shared knowledge like the one we're partaking in this evening. And when those kinds of attempts are thwarted by uh, a source of prejudice and discrimination, for example, stereotypes and prejudices the heroes of this person hold about their, uh, their race, their gender, their identity, um, and so on. Um, there's a growing literature on epistemic injustice um, in mental health specifically. And what was important to us, uh, given the, the theme of the series, is to think about how mental illness and people who are mentally disordered or uh, treated by the mental health care system are particularly vulnerable to certain kinds of epistemic injustice. And we will give lots of examples in a minute. Now, where we come in, uh, and uh, I should probably say that uh, Ian Kidd, who is uh, here in the audience tonight, has a, an ongoing and very uh, carefully curated and updated reading list on epistemic injustice in healthcare. So if you're interested in finding out more, we'll give some references at the end of the talk, but also do have a look at Ian, uh, Ian's um, website. So there is this growing literature on how epistemic injustice appears, happens, uh, takes place, and is exacerbated maybe within the domain of mental health care. A lot of that work has focused on how patient speech, so the, the things patients say, ask for, convey, demand, request, opine about, um, how that speech is overlooked and, for example, downgraded, ignored, uh, not taking into account when decision-making takes place. But within this context, Dan and I want to uh, turn our attention to the phenomenon of silence and think particularly not just what happens when people's uh, speech is being overlooked and ignored, but actually how silencing uh, plays itself out within the domain of healthcare, but also more broadly. And what we want to say is that so far silencing has been treated as exclusively a bad set of practices, an oppressive set of practices. And we want to sort of bring that into question by suggesting that there can be a sort of good silence as well. So um, 
I will hand over to Dan and I'll come back in a bit and say more about this. Right. So I think ba basically what we could say or what we're suggesting is that in philosophy right now and in other academic disciplines as well as in society more broadly, there seems to be this attitude of uh, sedatophobia, right? A fear of silence. So what we want to try to do in this talk is, like Javi said, we want to um, look more closely at silence. Um, and we're going to begin by um, showing you that silence can, of course, be bad in different contexts. And we're going to draw on some philo uh, uh, recent philosophical thought to illustrate this. But then we're going to illustrate some good types of silence and explain how those silences might fill an important epistemic role. Right, so like I said, in philosophy we tend to talk mostly about bad silences. And there's this recent book by a great philosopher, Jose Medina, um, and in this book he explores the communicative power of protest. Uh, and he's particularly interested in how protests can break silences but also be silenced. And in doing that, in exploring that dynamic, he highlights a number of different kinds of silences, or at least three. So the first of these is institutional silence, second is bystander silence, and the third is silences resulting from silencing practices. So I take, or we take his um, analysis of these silences to be fairly representative of this sedatophobic attitude in philosophical discourse. So we're going to start off by going through these silences, trying to illustrate them, uh, explain what's bad about them, uh, and then uh, yeah, illustrate them with some examples. Maybe a bit of a content warning is useful, so we're, we'll be using um, examples from the Me Too movement in addition to uh, examples from mental health, so there will be some talk about sexual assault in there. Um, so let's start out by thinking about institutional silence. So by institutional silence, Medina seems to mean something along the following lines. So this is when issues aren't officially recognized or discussed within institutions. Um, so you can imagine here, for example, the example of police violence in the Met before the Black Lives Matter movement, right? Um, Something that's important to say about uh, institutional silence is that it, it's kind of social in this particular way, or in two particular senses, right? So it's social to begin with that it occurs within an institution that's made up of people, but it also occurs, or can also occur because of routines and norms and material conditions that people in those institutions have made and hold in common, right? And something else that's notable about institutional silence is that it tends to be metaphorical rather than literal, right? So when people or people working in the Met uh, are institutionally silent about police violence, it's not that they're literally silent, right? They're still talking about other things, but they're not talking about um, police violence, at least not in the way that counts, right? In the context that matter and might change um, or address the issue. Um, but the fact that these silences are metaphorical rather than literal doesn't mean that they're any less significant, right? And again, the, the kind of issue of police violence in the Met illustrates this. So of course, it's been well known for decades that police violence is an issue within the Met. And there's been reports highlighting this. But just this year, the Casey Report could still wonder why, despite repeated abuses of power and instances of grievous police violence, the Met was still able to not engage in any significant self-reflection on the issue and try to address it, right? Bottom line is there's very good reason to take institutional silence seriously. Second type of silence, we want to look at is bystander silence. This is roughly what it sounds like. It's not speaking in the face of injustice or joining justified protests. And in this case, the silence can be both or either 
literal or metaphorical. So for example, I might literally be standing at the sidelines of a protest and say nothing, or I might be standing with my friends and talking about other things when other people are protesting, right? And, and this silence can be social in two different ways. So it can be facilitated by certain social norms and practices, right? Um, such that it might be the norm in your social circle that if you join a protest, well, then you're doing something uncivil or maybe something lefty, right? But it might also be social in the sense that it's performed by many different people at once. So that group that's standing by the sidelines of a protest. Now, something that's notable here is that, of course, we have or there are certain practices that are meant to fight bystander silence, at least in certain contexts. So for example, within workplaces, there's bystander training, and that's precisely meant to try to address people's unwillingness to address wrongs they see around them because of fear of speaking up, or, or fear of retribution, or um, fear of calling attention to oneself. Right? So this, again, is a science we, of course, should be taking seriously. And then a third kind of silence, we're going to dwell on this for a while now, is silence caused by silencing practices. Now, this uh, is a silence that Medina also spends quite a lot of time exploring. And what we mean by silencing here, and what he means by silencing here, is, is silencing in the philosophy of the language sense. And that stems from J.L. Austin's speech act theory. Uh, and it can get a bit difficult to understand, but basically it's about what the various parts or the various kinds of things that language can do, right? So let me try to illustrate this with an example, or I'm gonna try to illustrate these four different types of silencing with an example uh, from uh, the Me Too movement. So the claim, and sexual violence, right? That was a common claim during the Me Too protests. And this is an utterance that involves words that have a certain meaning, right? And it's also intended as a kind of action, as a, as a demand for people to do something to stop sexual violence. And it also has, or it can have, a certain persuasive effect. It could persuade people to do what people demand. And given all these things, this statement could be silenced in many or four different ways. So firstly, the would-be protesters, they might be prevented from uttering those words to begin with. So for example, police could arrest them before they get to the site where they were gonna protest. Um, or they might just be too afraid in the end to, to speak, um, to, to say it, right? Um, and this is what you can call pre locutionary silencing. So this, this utterance has, in effect, been silenced before it could be uttered. So there was no locution. Now, the second way it can be silenced is that the protesters might say the words. They might be on the square and say the words, but something interferes with other people's ability to understand them. There could be a counter-protest, say, where the voices of the counter-protesters um, um, cover up the, the voices of the protesters. So you can't hear what they're saying, right? And that's what we can call locutionary silencing. So that's where the understanding of the utterance, or there's a, not an understanding of the utterance. And then thirdly, uh, another way in which this statement could be silenced is the protesters might say, stop sexual violence or end sexual violence. And you, as the audience, might understand what they mean, but you don't take it as a call to action, right? Uh, if you're a sexist audience, you might think um, that the, uh, those words are actually just a demand for personal attention from women who aren't getting enough of that at home, right? And this is what we call illocutionary silencing. So this is where the call or, or, or the, the act part the, of an utterance isn't being taken up. And the fourth and final way this can be silenced is, uh, is when the words are understood. Um, 
and they are taking as a call to action, but they fail to persuade you as the audience that something needs to be done. You might think that, well, you don't have any power to do anything about it anyway, or you might think that sexual violence isn't actually a thing, right? And this is what is called uh, perlocutionary silencing. And now let's try to connect this really quick to, to mental health, right? So these sorts of silencing processes go on in mental health as well. So you can imagine, for example, someone who has been diagnosed with schizophrenia, who's experiencing a headache, really intense headache, maybe a migraine. So they go to the emergency room, but say in the first instance, this person is known to be schizophrenic. So when they come and they're distressed, the staff immediately send them off, maybe tell them to go home. They're having a, a, a mental health crisis, right? So that could be pre-locutionary silencing. They're not even allowed to raise the issue of their pain. Or they might be let in, they might be able to, uh, or they might be let into the office of the doctor, but as they start to explain their troubles, the doctor starts to speak and says, no, actually, I know that this is due to your schizophrenia. Let me give you some medication and you can go home. Um, I hope you can see the pattern there, right? So, so this could, we can take this further. So maybe we get to the point where the person makes a claim that I have a migraine, or I think I have a migraine. The doctor says, or the doctor thinks, no, actually, this, this is just a mental health crisis. This is playing out the same way as my previous example, but this is sometimes how it goes. So the doctor just puts it down to their schizophrenia, maybe without saying anything, and, and sends them home with some antipsychotics. Right, okay. So again, this, this type of silence, which is obviously a very broad category, silence caused by silencing practices. This can cause both literal and metaphorical silences, right? So it could result in an individual targeted by silencing practices to literally stop speaking in certain contexts, but it could also lead to metaphorical silences such that I, you won't bring up a certain topic in a certain situation because you know that there won't be any points. Um, and it's social because it's cultivated through what are clearly interpersonal practices, right? And the more these practices occur, the more ingrained the silence might become, uh, and the more hardened they might be, become as well, and then like, becoming part of uh, individual and collective habits. Um, and these types of silencing practices are closely related to epistemic injustice, as Javi explained it, right? So, um, when someone with schizophrenia comes to you and they say they have a headache, and you immediately think, no, this must be due to your psychosis, when, then you can in some sense be committing an epistemic injustice against them. Because what you're doing is denigrating their testimony about their personal suffering by putting it down to a particular aspect of their identity, their diagnosis in this instance. So you just assume that everything they say is because they have schizophrenia. right? So Medina thinks that these three types of silences, institutional silence, bystander silence, and silencing, silences resulting from silencing practices are all harmful and should be broken. And I, I think we agree with him that quite often they are harmful, right? Uh, and he thinks that protests have a special power to break these kinds of silences. In fact, he argues something quite strong on this basis. He says that we have a duty to uh, protest or to join protests as long as those protests are felicitous, meaning basically that they're justified. He says that do nothing in the face of a felicitous protest, and this is key. Doing nothing in the face of a felicitous protest is tantamount to remaining complicit in tolerating injustice by silence and inaction. And in our reading of this, this basically seems to amount to a duty to break silence, to break the silence, both our own silences and the silences of other people. But the question is then, should we really think that there is a duty to break silence? Now what's important to note is that Medina offers two important qualifications to this duty. 
Uh, to begin with, he recognizes that some protests uh, or, or some types of silences are communicative, right? So think, for example, of protests where people tape their mouths over or where people mourn silently in public. Well, these types of silences are communicating a particular message, right? So if we go out and try to break these silences, well, then we are at risk of effectively silencing communicative silences, right? So he's definitely against doing this. Um, a second instance where Medina seems to grant that there's no duty to break silence is if doing so would have special and severe costs for the person whose silence uh, is being broken. Now, initially, he sets the bar really high for what this could be. He says, for example, that this would apply when the individual's life is in danger or when their family's life is in danger. He then lowers this a bit. Um, but either way, what, what we want to draw out here is that, th so these two, especially the last one, is a really important qualification. Because it means that we don't have, always have the duty to break silence. But we think that Medina's qualification of this duty is underdeveloped. Uh, and this underdevelopment of uh, exceptions to the duty to break silence really points to a lacuna, not just in uh, Medina's work, but in, we think, ph philosophy more broadly. And we think it's really important to address this lacuna because without further elaboration of when and what types of silences shouldn't be broken, the burdens and injustices that marginalized people face are likely to be compounded by unjustified demands and expectations for them to speak. So at this point, I'm going to hand over to Javi for a bit. OK, so what we're, what we're trying to do is um, not, not be critical of um, calls to break silences about various things, but to try and be a bit more discerning about the types of silence there are and of which ones of these are, uh, ought to be, if you like, the target of silence-breaking practices and which shouldn't. So again, going back to this idea of epistemic injustice, the epistemic injustice literature so far has identified ways in which speech is blocked or disbelieved or ignored um, and try to offer remedies for that. But we, what we try and want to try and do is sort of go a step back and say, let's first of all look at the types of silences that are around and let's see which of them give rise to epistemic injustice and which don't, which ones we think ought to be targeted and which ought to be uh, sustained and even supported in some contexts. So the first thing to notice is that when we think about uh, these burdens of silence, and one thing that we notice is that the silences that have been targeted by uh, kind of silence-breaking uh, campaigns of various sorts have really focused on marginal silences and not privileged silences, right? So here's an example from um, Miranda Fricker's book. She says, well, look, uh, when people in the 1960s and early 70s started talking about sexual harassment, uh, a lot of women said, gosh, you know, this, this, this uh, concept is really useful because it really captures something I've experienced, but I didn't have the language to express it. And this term, sexual harassment, is really useful. But then it's possible that a lot of, for example, powerful men who were bosses in companies and you know, enjoyed the freedom that the pre-sexual harassment environment allowed them may have remained completely silent on the issue. Okay? So we can think of lots of cases where silence by powerful people suits them because it serves a particular interest. It might be that um, you know, I'm a politician and I'm being investigated for, you know, financial irregularities. And I say, I have nothing to say on the matter, right? And I make the work of the investigators and the prosecution really hard in that respect. Okay, so that's a silence. These are examples of privileged silence. And 
we don't think that privileged silence um, merits uh, silence breaking uh, uh, attempts of the kind we're talking about. So we're thinking about silence breaking attempts that are meant to actually give a voice to people who are silenced rather than of uh, silences of people who choose to remain silent because it suits them, right? So these kinds of privileged silence are maintained by people who simply stand to gain from it. Um, so we can see it as negative and sort of set it aside as a, a bunch of cases that we don't want to particularly uh, go into in more detail. And where it becomes problematic is when we think about the silences of marginalized people. And these are often seen as negative because they are seen as the outcome of some kind of oppression. So I wanted to speak up on behalf of women, for example, but I was scared of my boss. Or I wanted to uh, tell the, uh, my bully male colleague that he was intimidating to women, but I was too scared of him. Those are the kinds of examples of um, marginalized silence, silence that stems from being silenced and from uh, motivations such as, you know, fear, concern for one's own, say, career prospects or one's employment prospects and so on. Now, these kinds of m silence of marginalized people are often targeted by activists and other people saying, no, 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 we shouldn't remain silent. We should talk about sexual harassment. We should talk about mental disorder. We should talk about menopause. We should talk about whatever is, you know, the, the topic of the campaign. Um, and there's one way in which these discussions are really valuable, right? Because you say, well, isn't it great that now the word menopause is no longer a dirty word and we can talk about it and workplaces have started having menopause policies and so on. But what we want to do is also be really careful about the reasons for that people want to remain silent and respect certain contexts in which they have good reasons. So it's not clear to us that the silences, the marginalized silences, always ought to be targeted by these silence-breaking attempts, uh, campaigns to encourage people to talk about it. So here's an example. Um, the famous uh, Me Too campaign uh, where women were encouraged, as Elisa Milano says, if you've been sexually harassed or assaulted, write Me Too on your Facebook account, Twitter, whatever, as a reply to this tweet, if all the women who have been sexually harassed or assaulted wrote Me Too as a status, we might give people a sense of the magnitude of the problem. And the idea here is that by um, having lots and lots of women say Me Too, we are breaking a silence, we're making something that was invisible or kept underground or <clears throat> being uh, a topic that's sort of embarrassing and um, held some sort of uh, a, a guilt, if you like, on the, um, on the part of the person who was assaulted, <clears throat> all of a sudden saying me too, if lots and lots of women say me too, then that would A, give a sense of the scale of the problem and B, empower women by supporting each other to have more and more of them come out, if you like, and say, um, me too. So there's, there are promises here, and this imperative to speak out uh, promises, for example, social change, right? So the big hope of the Me Too campaign uh, and of other campaigns, for example, the Everyday Sexism Project, for those of you who, who know it, was social change. Um, have we had social change? I don't know. I mean, we, there were plenty, plenty of uh, Me Too posts. Um, it certainly made it more visible. And there was some, I don't know, some people say localized, some people say there were more principal changes with the, uh, the prosecution and the outing, if you like, of powerful men like um, J um, Jeffrey Epstein and Harvey Weinstein. And um, so some, uh, some people talked about sort of cleaning up Hollywood and so on. Um, other people are much less optimistic about the long-term lasting effects of the social change brought about here. And the second is, of course, the personal healing. And this relates to sort of another, if you like, um, paradigm that sometimes exists in some uh, quarters of, of uh, mental health thinking and in other places that if you, if this is a sort of a 
a kind of a, a purging paradigm, saying if you talk about it, if you let it all out, if you express your feelings, if you tell us about your trauma, you will feel better afterwards. You will have an opportunity for personal healing. And again, I think we want to tread very carefully, and we'll give some examples in a minute, because it's not entirely clear that letting it out or talking about it or posting Me Too necessarily can bring about this healing, can necessarily make things better for the victim. And of course, many sexual assault survivors were worried about this. They were saying, well, what if I talk about it and then all of a sudden, everybody who knows me, everybody who's my friends on Facebook know, knows th this terrible personal tragedy, this terrible trauma that happened to me. So I think what we want to see is both sides. On the one hand, the kind of bigger political picture where many voices join up into a, a coherent and powerful demand for social change. And on the other hand, the personal level in which um, women or, or people more generally say, I, I'm, I'm uncomfortable, I, I, I don't want to share with the whole planet potentially what, what happened to me, this, this terrible, dreadful uh, thing that happened to me. So I think we want to be aware both of the, the promise of the um, breaking the silence paradigm, but also the potential pitfalls of it. So let's see what kinds of good silence might, uh, might be around. So, so far we've talked, Dan gave some uh, powerful examples of what we call bad silences, which are the result of practices of, of oppression, of damping down on people's attempts to articulate their experiences or share their thoughts. And here is um, uh, Manya Whitaker about the Me Too. And she says, I don't think that people should be forced to speak up or asked to do so until they are ready, until they have had the opportunity to understand their experiences for themselves, until they have the supports in place around them to help them process through that experience. I think it can be really dangerous to hold victims accountable for things when they themselves don't really understand how it happened or why it happened, or they haven't gotten to a place of healing yet. If I keep silent, should I be ashamed of that? Um, and I want to now turn and try and articulate, this is uh, very early attempts, and there's a reference at the end to Dan's paper in Erkentnis that uh, starts doing this excellent work of uh, articulating the types of good or at least ambiguous silence, okay? So being silent needn't always be the outcome of silencing practices that are oppressive. And there may even be some cases where the silence is a result of an oppressive practice, but we don't necessarily want to have a wholesale call to break that silence. So um, the first is an unknowing silence that stems from a state of unreadiness to speak about a difficult experience. And the, this, this quote is exactly, she says, um, I think it can be really dangerous to hold victims accountable for things when they themselves don't really understand how it happened or why it happened, or they haven't gotten to a place of healing yet. So premature speech can be harmful. And this unknowing silence might be people saying, look, I'm just not ready to talk about this yet. It doesn't mean I'll never talk about it, but please don't put pressure on me to talk about it before I am ready. Um, and Dan calls this an unknowing silence, I guess in the sense of that you're not, you're not in a place of um, complete command of both your feelings about the, the event and also not in complete command of what will happen once you post Me Too. You can have, there have been a lot of sort of unanticipated responses. Uh, people could respond to you with pity they could respond with horror. They could respond with disappointment. Why didn't you tell me earlier, right? So being able to anticipate the, the types of reactions and how one would react to the reactions is also important. And unknowing silence holds these at bay and says, I'm not ready for this. Then we've got defiant silence. Um, you know, so somebody might say, tell me about your... Um, terrible childhood experiences when these, these terrible things happen to you. And somebody says, I'm sorry, I, I, don't, I don't want to. I don't want to, and I don't have to, and I don't need to. And that's a defiant silence in response to an unjustified demand to speak. So in some attempts to 
extract or encourage testimonies of difficult events, people have often said, these can be almost pornographic. These can be misconstrued. These could be done insensitively. Um, so imagine a policeman saying to a young woman who's just been uh, sexually assaulted. This is actually a true, um, a, a true um, account that kind of stuck in my mind because it happened to me when I was a very young teacher and one of my students had been sexually assaulted. And the, uh, the policeman turned up and this big guy and she was, she, was, she was very upset and barely verbal at all. And he kind of turned to her and said, okay, so where, where did it happen? In the toilet? Tell me, where did it happen? And she just burst into tears. You're gonna get a single word out of her. And the whole thing was um, in a way undermined by this request for speech um, that was met with, I guess, a, a kind of defiant silence. A silence assumed in response to an unjustified or um, an erroneous or an overpowering demand to speak. The third, and um, I think Dan rightly points out that these are not exclusive categories, so they might be kind of, they might bleed over into each other, is a protective silence when you hold something back that you don't want others to know. So uh, if there's any mothers in the audience, maybe like me, you hold some secrets of your children um, because uh, this is a kind of protective silence because you think um, you don't want others to know, maybe. Uh, maybe you want to maintain the privacy of yourself or your family or your children. There's lots of reasons and lots of ways that silence can actually be very protective, right? You don't want to disclose something about you or about your immediate family or about your experiences. And that's for very good reasons. I mean, um, we talk about privacy and I think in, in today's kind of um, social media age, people, and in particular, I think younger people who start experimenting with social media make uh, dreadful mistakes by not appreciating this protective power that uh, silence can have. And then another one, again, going back to the domain of mental health, we can think of therapeutic silence, the silence that has been uh, you know, much celebrated that takes place in the, uh, in the clinical or the therapeutic encounter in which both the therapist and the, uh, um, the person are both sitting in silence and lots of uh, mental or uh, psychological work is, is going on. That's another kind of silence that we could call a good silence. And then finally, there's a peaceful silence that um, I guess can be seen as a, a silence of not feeling a need to speak. And that also comes with age. <laughs> so a peaceful silence that comes from a place of feeling you know, replete or whole or not really wanting to jump into the fray with one's own um, owns opinions or own, own ideas. Okay, so just uh, to round us off, the broad contours of this uh, move we're trying to make are not to denigrate attempts at encouraging speech, but rather to, uh, again, shine the spotlight on silence as a vehicle for promoting epistemic agency in the ways, uh, in these ways I just talked about. So what we want to point out is the fact that epistemic agency requires communication in the broadest sense of the word. And that communication could be speech, but it could also, of course, include silence, pregnant silence, meaningful silence, productive silence. And what we think is that the pursuit of epistemic justice, when we are looking for how we make unjust epistemic practices more just, has to include a consideration of when speech is needed and when silence should be preserved. So I'll just close by saying that this is our uh, temporary website, our, our, our proper website, we've only launched the project uh, Epistemic Injustice in Healthcare Epic in September. Um, and if any of you are interested in knowing more about the project or knowing about project events, uh, the project will run across the uh, three institutions, which are Bristol, Nottingham, and Birmingham.
So if you're interested in uh, knowing more, do uh, tell one of us and we will get you added to the, to the mailing list. But I want to say a little bit about one thing uh, we feel very strongly about, which is that in healthcare, there is a lot of communication going on in mental health, but also in, in healthcare more broadly. And what the project sets out to do is to really bring benefit, not just to patients, but also to health professionals and anybody who comes into contact or works within the healthcare system by thinking about how these communications go wrong and what we can do to rectify that. And epistemic injustice is one type or one large and significant subset of things that can go wrong with communication within healthcare. Again, if you uh, look at patient uh, complaints over the years, one of the top uh, two or three complaints that have remained steady throughout um, as far back as we could find is I'm not being listened to. So thinking about that plight, that sense of not being listened to, um, is really what sort of piqued our interest in, in, in thinking about epistemic injustice. Um, and I think we, this, is, this is a six year project. We just started in September. We're very, very hopeful that during the project, uh, what we will do is have a set of empirical case studies uh, looking for and documenting instances of epistemic injustice in all different domains of healthcare and specifically within mental health. And that then armed with this uh, information and this evidence, we'll be able to work on um, strategies to ameliorate epistemic injustice, which is what Ian, um, our colleague here in the front row, is going to be working on in particular. So uh, bang on the money, 45 minutes, just to say thank you so much. Um, and uh, we'd be very happy to pick up on any of those themes in the, in the Q&A. But go easy on us because this is a brand new talk. This is the first time we've presented uh, this material uh, together. So uh, we'd be delighted to hear some of your thoughts and responses to it. Thank you so much. Thank you for the talk. I was thinking about your situations where there is a duty of breaking the silence, and one of them was when there is, it may cause severe harm. Um, I was just wondering, there are some situations where if you don't break the silence, the severe harm may be worth at a later stage. What do you think of that? Yeah, I, I think that's, that's spot on. I mean, Dan will say more about, about Medina, but you're, cer you're certainly right. I mean, also thinking about the, the, the previous comment, I mean, what we're starting to try and do is kind of systematize the types of epistemic injustice and systematize the types of silences and of silencing, of which there are many, as a way of trying to understand these phenomena more, more broadly. So you're absolutely right that there, there may be cases where um, keeping the silence is, is incredibly harmful, as the, the gentleman was just saying. Um, and there are other cases where breaking the silence might have a terrible cost. And you, you're right that often when people are um, considering whether to, to speak out or not, think about cases of whistleblowers, they know that it's going to cost them their careers, for example, or the uh, women in Iran who try and you know, speak against the, the, uh, oppressive, the regime as oppressive to women, right? or people who speak out in, in, in China and other places. It's, um, it's, inc it's incredibly risky to speak, and you're right that it's always a, a balance of costs of the cost of not speaking versus the cost of, of, of speaking out. And I think in, in each case, you will have a different kind of balance and in a, in a different decision. What we're trying to do is to consider the types of... Um, the types of factors that could impact each of these and how we might maybe find a way to break down the bad silences whilst conserving people's right to the good silences without you know doing you know sweeping them off across the board as 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 always bad that was the the effort here um there are 
like you categorize different kinds of um, silences. Um, so, but for me, there are kinds of silences that are that there are actually acts of communication, and there are those that are not uh, acts of communication. Do you make that dis distinction at all in the first place? Uh, yeah, I can take that. So we definitely make a distinction between communicative and non-communicative silences. You can even make a sharper distinction between silences that, and I think this distinction is important to make, silences that are intended to communicate, silences you can extract information from, and non-communicative silences. So the example I gave of protesters being silent in their protest, well, that's an intended, that's that those people are intending to communicate something with their silences, right? But I could extract something. Your silence could be communicative to me right now, even though you don't mean for it to. You're just listening to me, right? That's why you're silent. But I could be sitting here thinking, well, he's silent right now because he thinks I'm saying something very intelligent to him, right? And in that case, well, I'm extracting that information from you. And in that, that's when it's, this starts to become epistemically dangerous, right? Um, where we have a lot of tools available to us, and this is particularly true in the mental health field, there's a lot of tools that allow people to extract information from other people's silences, regardless of what they intend to communicate with those silences, right? And sometimes the intention is for it to be non-communicative, right? So if I'm kind of exercising a kind of um, protective silence, right? I often might not have the intention of showing you that I am protecting some kind of information, right? That's not why I am silent. I'm silent just to hold something back. And my hope in that situation would be for you to just note that I'm silent and maybe respect that silence and, and move on. Um, so I think, to, to, uh, to reiterate my answer, yes, I think it's very important to distinguish between communicative and non-communicative silences. There's a great paper on that called um, Eloquent Silences by Alessandra Tanasini where she uh, teases out some of the differences. Uh, and non-communicative silence is definitely important to take into account in order to uh, address epistemic injustice because I think that's a site where a lot of epistemic injustices can occur and it's an under-investigated site uh, of epistemic injustice where we impose uh, knowledge or interpretation in someone else's silence. We're at the risk of misunderstanding it. Thank you. Um, I had a question going epistemic injustice, um, thinking of diagnosis and the silencing effect of diagnosis, how once the diagnosis is placed, it can silence any further meaningful, perhaps, conversation that the job is done. The, it's, there is no, is there anything else to say? Yeah, that's interesting. I know you're going to have more to say about this, it, but I'll, I'll go first. Um, thanks. That's a, that's a really good point. I mean, I, I think I think it it can play both ways. So the example of diagnosis as in in mental disorder and silencing, I think, is an interesting one. So the example Dan gave earlier made me think about Eileen Sachs. Who's, um, who suffers with schizophrenia and wrote an account. And one thing she talked about is how um, she, had, she had some dreadful cardiovascular problem. I can't remember exactly what it was. And she went to the emergency room and she, she said, I've got these symptoms. And the doctor said, no, you're just psychotic. You're having a psychotic episode. And it was only when her sane friends came to the emergency room and said to the doctors, no, 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 we know what she's like when she's psychotic. This is not it. That they actually listened to them and believed them and acted on what they were saying and her life was saved. So I think you're right that there is uh, are elements to some kinds of diagnosis of some kinds of mental disorder that are, you know, disabling or, or silencing in that respect. So... Um, they, what they do is they medicalize a set of behaviors. They can um, 
pr present all sorts of obstacles I across the life domains, okay? But there are also sort of um, other voices within mental health. So I'm thinking here, for example, um, about Robert Chapman, who is an autistic person and writes about neurodiversity, who actually thinks that some kinds of diagnosis in some contexts can be empowering because they give people an identity and they give an explanation to, uh, to the, the suffering that brought people to, to seek mental health care or diagnosis or whatever. I think the uh, explanatory impact of getting a diagnosis is in particular important. Um, I mean, it's not that different to somatic disorders, right? So, you know, I, I struggled terribly with breathlessness and I thought it was because I wasn't fit and I thought it was because I wasn't exercising enough and because I was lazy and, and all, all kinds of terrible things. And then it turned out I had a respiratory condition. It had nothing to do with my willpower or my laziness or otherwise. Um, so in that respect, it can be really significant. I mean, obviously, there's also the clinical benefits of having a correct diagnosis. But even if we park those and just think in terms of people's identity and, and, and experience, I think it's, uh, I am quite swayed by the argument that in a lot of cases, the diagnosis can be helpful. Now, more the question more broadly, whether people ought to be able to choose to an extent whether a label is or isn't given to them is an interesting one. And again, I know a lot of discussions of parents saying, should I seek an autism diagnosis for my child? Here are the pragmatic benefits, here are the possible disbenefits. So it, the, the debate can also take place entirely on a pragmatic level saying, what services will be open to my child if they have a diagnosis of autism uh, versus the, for example, the, the stigma or the price otherwise paid by, uh, by a person uh, once they receive a diagnosis. So I think, again, the, the, the tally here is incredibly complex, can be very nuanced, depends massively on the, the context and the, the situation. And ultimately, I really agree with Chapman, ought to come from the person themselves. Whether they seek a diagnosis, whether they um, you know, take it upon themselves to see it as part of their identity or not, these I, I leave entirely to uh, a person's you know, subjective preferences and, and circumstances. I think that was a really comprehensive and good answer, but I'll take the opportunity to plug my book that's up there, which explores these kind of complex dynamics on the political level, where I kind of look at, well, in terms of political agency rather than sil silencing, how diagnoses, psychiatric diagnoses specifically, can empower and disempower in the public sphere. Right? So I explore, for example, what's known as the user survivor movement, where people, although uh, parts of that movement oppose the uh, mainstream psychiatry, uh, are to an extent relying on their psychiatric diagnosis to create a common sense of identity and empower them. But I also look at, say, something like the Occupy movement, where it seemed that it was very much the case that parts of the media deployed psychiatric diagnoses to make it seem like there was something wrong um, with the protesters that was kind of politically irrelevant. So they had issues that shouldn't be discussed in the political arena. <laughs> Hi. Um, I was wondering whether you thought about the extent to which the validity of a possible good silence can be affected by the recipient of that silence. So what I mean by that is if you take your Alyssa Milano example, so, you know, the cost of someone to respond me too to that could be quite high personally, right? It exposes them. Um, they could be harassed as a consequence, etc. But that same person, for example, could have a close friend who you know, they were aware was suffering for a similar trauma and by speaking to them interpersonally about that trauma could have a really, you know, significant positive effect on, on them. So then is there a question about whether a, a good silence in one context, you know, who you're being silent to can potentially be a bad silence in a different context? Yeah, I'm, absolutely. I think I'm, part of what we're doing here is just trying to create more nuance in the discourse around silence, right? So something that I discuss in the Experiences of Silence article up there, uh, 
is a campaign that ran a few years ago as it was launched as part of Britain's Got Talent. It was called Britain Get Talking. Uh, and that involved the hosts of Britain Get Talking suddenly interrupting the show to say, listen guys, we're gonna give you, the audience, a minute's silence to talk about mental health, right? And you could see, uh, like, the, the intention there is good. But part of what might happen there is that all of a sudden you're forcing these uh, discursive spaces onto people. Maybe they're sitting around the TV watching Britain's Got Talent with their family. Maybe their family senses that there's something that they're suffering, and all of a sudden everyone turns to you and expects you to talk, right? That's the situation where the kind of break the silence discourse might precisely work against more nuanced approaches to silence, where it's often the case that one silence that's good in one context might be bad in another, right? Or one silence that should be kept in one context should be broken in another. Um, so I guess my, my kind of cop-out answer is that, yeah, I basically agree, and at this point we just want to kind of mark out some more nuance in the debate. I don't think it's a cop-out answer. I, I think you're, you're spot on that the perspective from which the silence is viewed can ascertain whether it's good or bad and that a silence can be good in one, from one perspective and, and, and bad in another. I mean, the interesting thing in what you're saying, I was thinking about how, you know, people's sort of narratives or life stories change a lot depending on who they're sharing them with, right? And it might be that, you know, this person who says, okay, I will come out and post me too, not for myself, it will be at a cost for myself, but it will be to support my friend. And again, that could be the kind of trade-off that, that might seem worthwhile to that person. So, so that's a really nice way of, you know, complicating the relationship between the two silences because we presented them as if it's either one or the other. And you're, you're absolutely right that they could be both. Yeah, I was wondering uh, what your aim is with your systemization of silence. Is there an aim, like a value system that you're aiming towards? Uh, do you want a, a particular type of society? Are, are you thinking about that when you are systemizing these different types of good and bad silences? Is it for better mental health? Is it for a better world? <laughs> Utilitarian, you know, Kantian, whatever. Uh, what, what are you thinking? Um, both for better mental health and a better world. So alongside kind of writing about this uh, in the context of uh, epistemic injustice in healthcare, I am, as I mentioned, I'm interested in kind of working out what the implications of this more nuanced, nuanced picture of silence is on the political level. I haven't gotten to the point of figuring out how is this going to make the world better, but I think that a more nuanced understanding of silence can inform a better understanding of the sort of right to silence we ought to have in society today. So what's interesting around the, this concept of the right to silence, it's probably, it's probably one of the most famous rights in the world, right? So every time you watch an American TV show, you'll hear the police say, you have the right to remain silent, right? An interesting fact is that we actually don't have the right to remain silent. In this country, your silence can be used against you in a court. Um, so part of what I want to think about is how, well, that silence, even when it exists, or that right, sorry, even when it exists, only apply in a very narrow legal context. I think we need to have a broader right to silence, one that can safeguard us against having to break good silences, but also um, relatedly having to expose ourselves to certain kinds of, for example, epistemically unfair situations where people might be trying to get us to talk but only as a means to maybe, um, I don't know, kind of whitewash their operations, right? So there's a lot of examples of where organizations will call their minor a minority employee in to a committee and have them speak, but really they're not so interested in what the minority person have to say. They're bringing them to the room so that they can later say, oh, well, this, this group has informed our policies on this, right? And that can have very negative epistemic consequences, both for the individual who was called into the room and wasn't listened to, but also to the group they represent, who has then lost an opportunity potentially to have their perspective on an issue heard. Well, thank you.
I, I just want to ask this project how much of cultural nuance is being read into it. Because you realize that from culture to culture, silence has different different connotations. If I'm not offending any religious feelings here, if you call to mind when the woman caught in adultery was brought before Jesus. And they said Jesus was writing in the sand. I mean, he didn't say anything until all the accusers left and there was no one to accuse the lady. And I was just thinking of the African culture and what silence means to them in terms of verbalizing, in terms of internalizing. And for all of this, it, it carries so much weight. So I just want to ask if in your project, how much of cultural, the diversity in, in culture is read into this because it could be very fascinating. Thank you. Thank you so much. We, we really welcome that because that's something that we thought about a lot in the, in the project when we were designing it. Um, so in particular, I would say the group we have in Birmingham is doing a, uh, um, a study of uh, young people with <coughs> psychotic symptoms. And uh, that group through, um, not through accident, I think, but as a reflection of, you know, societal discrimination and um, disadvantage that is spread unequally across our society, um, m many of these young people are people of color. And we're very, very interested in understanding that, that relationship. And I think a lot of psychiatrists are also very interested in, in understanding that, that relationship. So that's just one example of one of our case studies that will involve that. And we're also looking across, not just within the UK, but we've, we're also working with partners in, in Italy, um, who I presume have, as you say, very different approach to, um, to epistemic injustice and to communication and to speech. The really important thing for us, I mean, going back to the world-changing comment, is to, is to think about, you know, what would be useful for people who, are, um, who come into contact with, with health healthcare services. And we think one thing that is useful is obviously giving people the opportunity to be heard and to be listened to respectfully. But the flip side of that is also the opportunity for people to be respectfully allowed to maintain their silence if they so choose. So, um, so we think, we think they're, they're intrinsically connected, right? In the same way that um, if you force somebody to speak, they will tell you untruths because you've just forced them. Um, forcing people to break the silence can have you know, various harmful effects, which we're, we're trying to work out in the, in the project. But thank you for your, for your comment. Uh, thank you for the talk, guys. Um, my question is, how much do you think phenomenology is going to influence your work on this research project? It's going to inform it very much. That's precisely what I'm setting out to do. So I'm going to, as part of my um, case study on the EPIC project, I'm going to apply a phenomenological approach to explore uh, experiences of silence among people with mood disorders or bipolar disorders. Um, and I think it's partly what I start to do, but they're not so explicitly in uh, that paper that's listed there. So, uh, and I think it's, it's a very productive approach for highlighting the different sorts of silences and their uh, different sorts of silence and silences that people experience and the structure of those silences and how that structure might challenge some of our sedatophobic attitudes, right? Um, now, of course, that becomes tricky once we start to kind of, or I should put it like this. My approach to phenomenology is not that I'm trying to elucidate some transcendental structures 
of silence, right? I'm going into this very much with the understanding that what I'm highlighting through my phenomenological investigations of silence in uh, bipolar disorder is very much uh, kind of of people who live today in a particular context, in a particular circumstance, in a particular time, right? Um, short answer is just yes, I think it will be very important. I think it's a good, good point to raise. Hey, so uh, yeah, thank you very much uh, for your talk and your work. Uh, so if this is all about communication, um, then the for, for the you know if there's a signal something which receives a signal the, sig the 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 receiver will receive it to the degree in which they were silent to begin with so how much are you going to actively look at the silence of the listener in facilitating the meaning of whatever is present you know and and, and facilitating that uh, you know that that opportunity for the other person to communicate through their silence in listening uh to start with, I guess, I, I can open this because this is something that I have been beginning to explore phenomenologically. And I, I do, I, we do look at it, right? Because it's very important because the silences that we kind of perform as part of conversation are often really implicit, right? So right now, while you're silent, while you're talking, you're probably not thinking actively of the fact that you're not talking. But nevertheless, it's filling a really important function in our conversation, right? If you weren't silent right now, then I couldn't be talking to you. And probably you wouldn't be able to hear what I'm saying either, depending on how kind of loudly you, you begin to speak as I'm speaking. But, so short answer is it's very important. I think that will kind of form a central part of my continuing in investigations of experiences of silence. Uh, Harvey might have more to say about this on the epistemic injustice level. I, I think it, it really echoes what I said to the gentleman in the back, that the, the, the type of listening, of course, is, is critical. And the one thing we're very interested in is this idea of, you know, could be, you could call it respectful listening, but there could also be a, a listening that can, can, you know, contain and hold, I guess, in the mental health context, that's very critical. Um, and, and maybe other kinds of silence, but I think each and every one of us in this room knows the difference when you, you go into the doctor and you, you start talking about the reason you're there. And you, when they're um, listening out for particular clinical facts in a, in a kind of slightly, you know, short way. And when they are completely attending to what you're saying as a, as a person, if you like, and we all know that there's a big qualitative difference between these two, and we're all incredibly sensitive to that. So I think one thing that we hope to achieve in the last part of the project when we um, develop tools for healthcare professionals is precisely thinking about different ways of attuning yourself to the speech of others. And I think as teachers, we try to do it. I think as, as humans, we try to do it as best we can. And it's a really interesting, I think, um, accompaniment to the to the again intensive focus on on speech that that comes in in the epistemic injustice literature but also in, i think in philosophy of language yeah hi so i was just wondering how you account for these other uh, ways of interpreting silence when silence uh, is is what you see from the outside uh, but if you're not able to empathize enough and attune to, to the other in front of you, you, you won't be able to uh, grasp or, or, or attempt to understand what's going on beyond that silence, which could be uh, rage, which could be uh, frustration, which could be a series of things. And then also the... the the silence, uh, the, the reaction of that type of silence to the person who is in silence, who could be uh, screaming inside, who could be full of uh, other um, voices in their head uh, of um, rumination, overthinking, um, fear, uh, and, and how 
you know, silence is just one layer of this process. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't have much to, to add other than to say um, absolutely that's the kind of thing that, that needs to be to be studied. And that's, that's really um, a very articulate way of, of saying some of the some of the stuff that might go on in 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 a in a silence and in in good listening, which I think is what you're what you're pointing to. So I guess <clears throat> the same way that there is good silence and bad silence, there's good listening and and bad listening, and we can easily think of how that taxonomy might go. Hmm. I, I could add a bit that um, in some of my work, I'm I'm developing an understanding of silence that um, includes thinking about silence is not just that occur kind of externally and around us. So right now, you're kind of outward, you're, you perform, you're performing kind of outside silence that allows me to speak. Just now, I was outwardly silent. And inside, while I'm speaking right now, I'm not simultaneously thinking, right? So there's an inner silence in me while I'm speaking. And I think it's very interesting to think about, particularly in cases of, say, depression, how outward and inner silence come, can come together and come apart, right? Such that, well, sometimes silence in depression can be uh, understood as, a, as an aspect of your illness, right? So you might be silenced because you feel like you have nothing to say. So there's a particular kind of, I guess you could say painful inner silence that's preventing you from engaging in conversation. But you can also, building on what, what you, like this mention of rumination, right? Sometimes that silence can be, the silence can be peaceful, right? So you can, you can suddenly experience this sense that not, not only do I not feel a need to speak, but there's also nothing, no intrusive thoughts in my head, right? So I think these are very important phenomena that are worth elaborating. Uh, thanks, Harvey Dan. You separated good and bad kinds of silence. But I suppose that introduces the possibility that people can um, to deceive themselves about the nature of their silence. I'm thinking bad faith silences, where maybe out of cowardice, a person pretends that they're engaged in therapeutic or protective silence. Really, they're just, they're a coward. They're just too afraid to speak. Um, or a slightly different case where some people are very skilled at presenting their silences in one way, where in fact they reflect something else. I had a colleague who was very skilled at feigning a kind of respectful silence, invariably when women gave talks. But I knew from talking to him after a few pints, it was just contemptuous. But he was very, very skilled at presenting. And in both cases, you have a mismatch between the kind of silence being presented. And the first, it's self-deception. The second, it's deception of others. And I wonder how those kinds of false silences factor in. Great point. <laughs> um, think, I mean, it would, it would, it would fall prey to any other attempt to to understand, you know, kind of um, people's true intention. And I guess the one thing that would that would interest me a little bit more is what would be the effect of the silence on other people. I think trying to you know, look inside somebody's head is, is always going to be a, a tricky one. Um, and maybe I'm not so worried about that. Maybe um, the person who manipulatively uses silence for, you know, power or political effect or, or some other effect is, is not really um, at the focus of, of what we're trying to do here, which I guess is to think about good faith silences, and also to think about the impact silence has on, on others. So that's the first stab, but I, I think there's probably more to say about this. Can I follow that question up very quickly, which is um, whether there's a place for the idea of false consciousness in your account of silence. So it occurred to me when you're talking about Me Too, the distinction between people who want to go public and people who say, no, I prefer not to. Is there room to, for a kind of political critique of the preference not to go public? I mean, that may be what you say you want, but really because your preferences have been formed by a political system in which women are t tend to be silenced on these questions anyway, you are actually, we ought to start trying to talk you out of that preference. 
I think there is room for that, but I think that's where most of the discussion around silence is right now, where the presumption seems to be that silences, when they are kept, they are a result of false consciousness. Um, yeah, and I, I guess that's, that's kind of what we're trying to push back. And that's not to say it doesn't occur, right? It seems very likely that the sorts of silencing practices we have discussed can be result of, can result in adaptive preferences where I decide, well, uh, or maybe initially I thought, well, I'm, I'm too afraid to speak up. And then I eventually begin to think, no, I actually, I don't even, I didn't even want to speak up. I have, I have nothing to say in this context. Um, yeah, so the answer is yes, but that's not the, what we're focused on here, obviously. Okay, great. Thank you. Let's thank Harvey and Dan once again for their presentation. Thank you.